Good evening. My name is Lawrence Harris, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Chief of Community Engagement and Strategic Partnerships for the Clark County School District. We will begin our program this evening with a welcome by our Interim Superintendent, Dr. Sonona Thomas. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us tonight as we share information regarding our plan to bring students back to in-person learning. The Clark County School District has worked through the unprecedented task of planning a safe return to school amidst a global health crisis, continually evaluating and balancing the conditions of Athens Clark County and the need to support students, families, and our staff. We are confident in our ability to safely bring students and staff back to the classrooms. We recognize we cannot eliminate all of the risks, but we will implement as many infection control measures as we can, with the health and safety of our students and staff remaining our highest priority. Since the beginning of the pandemic, CCSD has watched other counties, both neighboring and across the state, who have returned to school and we have learned from their experiences. We have monitored local, regional, and statewide COVID data and statistics. We have listened to and learned from public health officials, guided by data for the region and state, combined with recommendations from the Georgia Department of Education, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Georgia Department of Public Health. And also looking at the potential effect of college students return the district decided to start the school year in a virtual environment for all students and staff. This decision provided, I'm sorry, proved to be the correct course of action as cases spiked in September. The reopening metrics supported our health and safety during that time. And as you all remember, the metrics were designed to pivot as necessary based on public health guidance. In late September, the CDC released new guidelines for reopening schools. These guidelines confirmed the need to monitor the number of cases per 100,000 and positivity rate, both of which Clark County School District was already doing. They also recommended that schools consider additional indicators to guide reopening decisions. Some of these additional indicators include the district's ability to implement mitigation measures, the percent change in new cases from week to week, and a variety of community factors, including hospital bed capacities and recent community spikes and in infection. As we aligned our discussions to the CDC guidelines, we worked with our local public health officials, and they helped to guide and confirm our decisions on how and when to reopen. As the CDC notes, the reopening indicators should not be used in isolation nor should they be viewed as a hard cutoff by school districts. They serve as a guidepost for reopening discussions and we have used them in Clark County as such. We know the best place for our students to be is in their classrooms. And we are confident that through our planning and infection mitigation measures, we will be able to bring our students and our staff back safely. We will continue to offer virtual instruction for those families who wish for their child or children to remain at home. However, the impact of a missed semester of in-person learning is long lasting and it has profound consequences, not just for our students, but also for our community as a whole. Our community cannot afford to have another lost generation of students. We have made too much progress to go backwards. We must continue moving forward as a system. We know that a successful return to instruction will require the help of everyone in the community. These are some of the ways that you as parents and community members can assist us. Please, please keep your children home if they are sick. Please report all cases of COVID in your household to your child's school. If your child is sick, we need to be able to reach you. If your numbers have changed, emergency contacts have changed, we ask that you share that information with your school so that someone can contact you in case of an emergency. And like we tell our students, and you've seen on the screen, we need you to remember the three W's. Wear your mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance. 
As Clark County School District, we commit to transparency and communication about COVID cases within Clark County School District. We commit to continuing to work with local health officials to guide decisions about classroom quarantines and if needed, school closures. We commit to providing our plan as recommended by public health partners. And as always, we commit to providing a quality education for all of our students. As I prepare to end this evening, I want to say thank you to our amazing staff. We couldn't do this without you. We have seen you working hard through virtual instruction, and now we see you working hard to prepare for our reopening. We see you and we appreciate you. To the teachers and administrators who have worked tirelessly to create new models for learning, we say thank you. To the nutrition and transportation staff who have pivoted to ensure that every student continues to receive a nutritional meal for every day, we thank you. To our custodians who ensure our buildings are clean and safe. To school nurses, counselors, social workers, psychologists, other support staff who are always thinking outside the box, we thank you. To all of the staff working behind the scenes every day to make school happen for our children, we thank you. And finally, to our parents and guardians, thank you for your patience, your understanding, your tough questions, which have helped to make us think better, and for your support as we continue to navigate this new learning environment. Thank you for working alongside us and for being our partners. Indeed, we will be better together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Tonight's program is about providing information to our families on the various aspects of students returning to our buildings on November 9th. We will have several presentations by some of our district leaders, and at the end, we will invite you to get your questions answered. While we will not be able to answer all questions tonight, we will answer as many as we can and post responses to the rest of the questions Friday morning on our website. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker of the evening, our Director of Nursing Services, Ms. Amy Rohrer. First. Good evening. My name is Amy Roark. I'm the director of nursing for the Clark County School District. Thank you all for being here, whether it's in person or um, whether you're watching virtually. Uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in and paying attention to our reopening plan for school. Let's get started. So as we look to reopen, we have spent a lot of time planning and preparing our health and safety reopening procedures because, as Dr. Thomas said, we are committed to a safe return for our students and staff. That remains our top priority. As we look to reopen schools, there's kind of two things we have to think about. We have to think about infection mitigation strategies for our building. What can we do in our buildings to reduce the spread of an infection, whether that's COVID-19, the flu, strep throat, any sort of bacterial or viral infection that may be going around. What, can, what measures can we put in place? Things like PPE, face coverings, hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, social distancing, or cleaning and sanitization of our surfaces and buildings and buses. So those are the things that we're gonna discuss first as measures that we can put in place to keep people safe and healthy. The other thing we're going to discuss is the school district's response to a known infection. So how do we respond when somebody reports a positive case? When COVID has been identified in our buildings, what actions is the school district going to take? So very simply put, all students and staff are going to be required to wear face masks while indoors and around other people. That's non-negotiable. It's supported by the DPH and CDC. We know that wearing a face covering reduces the transmission of the virus. We also know that students and staff need mask breaks. Uh, you can't wear a mask all day without taking it off, so we're gonna work through the North schedule. Um, Pre-K students can take off their masks when they nap. Obviously, students will take their masks off when they eat, and we're encouraging all schools to work in additional mask breaks throughout the day as appropriate and safe. Some ideas have revolved around recess, having mask-free zones, or allowing kids to spend the first 10 minutes of their recess 
not wearing a mask. Um, there's different options for schools to think creatively, but mask breaks are being worked into our schedules because we recognize that they're needed. Staff is the same requirements. Masks are to be worn, and we encourage all of our staff, teachers, parents, administrators, please set a good example. Our students are watching us, um, and it's important that we set an example and teach them how to do the right thing when it comes to wearing face covering. It, it is the expectation that parents will send their child to school with a face covering. Um, staff as well. Everybody is expected to bring their own. However, if you have don't have one or have a barrier to getting one or if you can't find it when your kid's running out the door or if it drops in a mud puddle on the way to school, we will have extras for you. Um, we will have extra masks for students and staff available in our school building should someone need one. We also have additional PPE. Different levels are needed for our different positions in our district. Um, school nurses and special education staff are equipped with higher levels of PPE. But we will also have a PPE closet in all of our schools that will just have extra supplies available for anybody who needs them, whether it's gowns or gloves or face shields or face masks or hand sanitizers or cleaning wipes. Every school will be stocked with a PPE closet that is available for use by all students and staff. Hand washing is perhaps the simplest and most effective thing we can do to prevent the spread of any infection. So we are going to increase our efforts around hand washing in all of our buildings, um, our educational efforts, our signage efforts, our reminder efforts, um, and our practicing efforts. Honestly, everybody's going to be washing their hands a lot, whether it's in and out of recess, in and out of the lunchroom, in and out of the classroom, um, in and out of the building. We will, we will implement increased hand washing practices. Physical distancing is also an important mitigation measure. It's important because it's how we're going to avoid having to quarantine individuals if we can keep people apart. Um, that's the key to reducing exposures in our building. So to every extent possible, I should stop here and say that we realize we cannot eliminate all the risks as we look to return to school, but we can do the best we can. We're gonna try very, very hard to socially distance children in our classrooms and throughout the school day. And in cases where that's not possible due to classroom size and number of students, we will do everything we can to group students in small groups that are socially distanced from another group of students. The idea being to minimize the cross exposure that occurs in our building. So if somebody does test positive, the entire classroom is not exposed to that person or the entire grade or the entire school. That's the whole goal of social distancing and keeping kids cohorted together is to try and minimize cross exposure should someone test positive. Every school is gonna have a designated waiting space um, where anybody who's symptomatic can go sit and wait for their parents to pick them up. It's away from others. When we start talking about our, our response to the virus, we're moving away from the infection mitigation side of that first slide and moving over to our response to the virus. One of the things we can do is screen, is screen people. So as you have your temperature checked when you walk in the door tonight, we're gonna to be doing that in all of our elementary schools, daily temperature checks. We have school nurses in all of our building who can screen students or staff who may be feeling ill throughout the school day. We also have telehealth, which is very exciting this year. We have a telehealth team of nurses who have access to COVID testing, flu testing, strep testing, all sorts of urgent care type um, health care can be done in the school clinic through a telehealth visit. So we can schedule an appointment with parental consent to either our Hillsman Health Center or a private pediatrician or any sort of any Piedmont Athens Regional Doctors, and we can run a COVID test right in our school clinic or a flu test or a strep test as needed. That's a huge convenience to families and to staff as well. As far as staff, staff are required to stay home when they're sick. That's our expectation. We expect staff to stay home just like we expect parents to keep their children home when they are sick. If staff have signs and symptoms of COVID, then they're required to notify their supervisor and not come to work that day. If they happen to fall ill while at school, again, they can visit the school nurse for a screening and go home if needed. Staff also have access to the telehealth visits.
As Dr. Thomas said, we really are committed to communicating transparently with our school district about cases. Um, so we recommend testing and we will be posting our case numbers every Friday on our district website. We will post the number of students and staff who have reported positive, positive tests as well as the number of students and staff who are in quarantine as a result of exposures to those positive individuals. Every time a child or staff member tests positive for COVID in one of our schools, all of the families with the child in that building will receive an email notification. An FYI, heads up, so to speak, that there's been a positive case of COVID at the school. If your child is deemed by through the contact tracing process to be a close contact to that individual who tested positive, which as you all probably know by now means within six feet for 15 minutes or more within a 24 hour period, then an additional notification and a phone call will go out to the family whose child is required to quarantine for 14 days. Every school is gonna have a COVID response team at the school level, and there will also be one at the district. The COVID response team will respond to any COVID-related issues that may arise throughout the school day. They will communicate those issues up to the district. They will implement contact tracing in collaboration with the district. They will work to send home communications to families as necessary. They will be responsible for uh, looking at seating charts, looking at bus routes, figuring out where any potential exposures have been. So um, every school will have a COVID-based response team as well as one at the district. Our flow chart for response is pretty simple. Uh, we're gonna screen individuals as necessary. And if anybody is symptomatic of COVID, they will be placed in a waiting area away from others to be picked up. If somebody reports a positive test to the school, then the school nurse or another member of the school-based COVID response team will kind of jump into action and gather all the information needed to complete a COVID-19 reporting form. They'll include seating charts, post contacts, bus routes, all the things that we just talked about. That COVID reporting form will get sent up to the district level where myself and the district level contact tracing team will work with the school-based team to figure out what we need to do. If we need to make more phone calls, how big is this exposure circle, and make decisions based on the knowledge that we have. The response will be the contact tracing as well as communication to families and we've been in public health. I should say that in any situation that we don't feel comfortable handling or we have questions about, we will reach out to our local health department. I have a very close working relationship these days with our local epidemiology team, as well as public health officials around our county and at the state level. And so um, should we have questions about whether or not to quarantine a whole class or whether or not to shut down a school, we will call in public health to help guide those decisions. We are not trying to, to, to make them on our own. So quarantine and isolation periods are different. And let me just look at my next slide here. So as you know, people who are quarantined are people who have been exposed to the virus, right? The word quarantine is for people who have been exposed. People who have been who are isolating is that word is used for people who have the virus, people who are sick, people or people who have been diagnosed. The um, incubation period for the coronavirus is 14 days. That's why the quarantine period is a 14 day period because for any time after you get exposed on day one, you could become ill in the next 14 days. That's why if your child is required to quarantine, it means they've been exposed to the virus and they can become sick anytime in the next 14 days. Isolation is what people have to go into when they are sick, when they have positive COVID diagnosis, whether they feel bad or not. The infectious period for the coronavirus is 12 days, and it starts two days before symptom onset. So I call that negative two days and 10 days after symptom onset, which is why the isolation period for the coronavirus is a 10 day period. So if you have COVID, if you um, have a positive diagnosis, you're either mildly or moderately ill, which is what the majority of people are, or you're severely or critically ill. By CDC guidelines, severe or critical illness from COVID is defined by having to be hospitalized, having extreme difficulty breathing or shortness of breath. Um, the other option is that you could have COVID and be asymptomatic. So if you have COVID, you kind of fall into one of those three categories. Since most people are symptomatic with mild or moderate illness, we'll start there. If that's the case, then that individual has to stay home for 10 days. That's the isolation period we just talked about. 
before they can return to school. They also have to have 24 hours without a fever, without the use of fever reducing medications like Tylenol or Advil, and they have to be feeling better. You have to have resolving symptoms and feeling better to come back to school. If you're symptomatic with severe or critical COVID, well, that 10 days gets doubled to 20. And so you have to stay home for a 20 day isolation period. And again, have 24 hours fever free before returning to school, as well as just be feeling better overall. If you are asymptomatic, but you've been diagnosed with COVID, you still have to isolate for 10 days. And this is where, you know, it's a little bit tricky because you feel fine, but you're still infectious. You could still transmit the virus to people who are around you. In fact, asymptomatic individuals have been shown to have similar viral loads to symptomatic individuals. So even if you feel fine, if you've had a positive COVID test, you have to isolate for 10 days. At any point during that 10 days, if you convert to feeling symptomatic or being sick, then you would have to isolate from the point of that symptom onset. Now, asymptomatic persons who have a known exposure, this is the vast majority of people, the people who are quarantined. They're not, they don't have COVID that they know of, but they've been exposed to COVID, and so they have to quarantine, but they feel fine. Well, this is the 14-day period. This might affect children in the school building if they're within close contact with somebody who tests positive. And in that 14-day quarantine, a test is recommended on day six through 10 because we know that most people who are exposed to COVID will become sick between days five and seven. If, you, if you're going to be symptomatic, the majority of people are day five to seven. So a test on day six to 10 catches the majority of those people. However, a negative test during an asymptomatic quarantine does not allow you to return to school early. And that's because you could have a negative test on day six, but you could still get sick on day 10 because everybody remembers that the incubation period for COVID is 14 days. So I know that's complicated. I've explained it a lot, and I think that everybody probably understands it by now, hopefully. But if not, you can reach out to me with any questions. I think it's a community effort to go back to school. We need the help of our parents, we need the help of our staff, we need the help of our leaders, and we need the help of our students. And so I appreciate everybody's everybody's time and effort into helping the Clark County School District have a safe and healthy return to school. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. My name is Brandon Gaskins and I'm the Chief Academic Officer and I will walk you through our instructional updates. So our first update relates to our four instructional models. So our four, four instructional models include the separated model, the segmented model, the simultaneous model, and the quadrant model. So the separated model is where the teacher completely teaches in person or completely teaches remotely. So for example, a school may have five fifth grade teachers. So four of those fifth grade teachers would teach all of those students that were in person and then we would designate one teacher to teach all of the students that were in a virtual environment. In the segmented model, this is where a teacher would teach both completely in person and completely virtual. So for example, a sixth grade ELA teacher, her third grade class might be um, completely in person, and then her fourth grade, um, excuse me, her fourth period class might be in a virtual environment. The simultaneous model is the model where the teacher is teaching both remotely and in-person students um, simultaneously or at the same time. And then the last model is the quadrant model. So this is the model where we pull our enrollment across the district and resources to serve students from different schools. So yesterday I reported that we did not have any schools that were using the quadrant model. Um, our Office of Early Learning is actually using the quadrant model specifically just for our pre-K students. So we receive a grant from right from the right from the start. Right from the start informed us that we needed to re-roster our students. So all of our students that were virtual needed to be in a virtual class with other virtual students, and all of our students that were in face-to-face -face would continue in a face-to-face -face environment. Because we are pooling our students across the district. Some of our pre-K um, students will have different teachers. So as we look at our bell schedule for face-to-face -face instruction, for our elementary school students, our buses will arrive anywhere from 7 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. 
our middle school students, the buses will arrive as early as 8.10 to the schools and deliver those students as school, um, excuse me, students as late as 8.35 a.m. The school day will start at 7.40 for our elementary school students. It will start at 8.45 for our middle school students. And the end of the school day will be 2.40 for our elementary school students and 3.45 for our middle school students. Our face-to-face -face bell schedule does impact our virtual bell schedule. So the current virtual bell schedule will be adjusted to accommodate face-to-face -face instruction and the virtual instructional model of the school. So virtual models may vary from school to school and each school principal will inform parents of how that virtual schedule will be enacted. So as we think about classroom setup and mitigation practices, there are some important, important things that we want to share with you all. So the first thing is that our classrooms will be set up for social distancing using student barriers and desk arrangements. All students and teachers will wear masks in the classroom, as Amy Aurora just mentioned, and we will have frequent mask breaks for those students. Students will participate in frequent bathroom breaks to wash hands, including before and after lunch and after recess before and after recess. Teachers will assign seating to assist with contact tracing if needed. And then um, Mr. Fisher, our Chief of Operations, will talk about the um, dividers that will be provided for all K through fifth grade students. So we have three major transitions throughout our day in our elementary and our middle schools. One of the major transitions is breakfast and lunch. Another major transition is specials for our elementary school students and connections for our middle school students. And then of course, recess. So our first transition, breakfast and lunch, students will receive their breakfast from grab and go locations that are in the building. So either students will enter the school either from the car rider line or from the bus line, and they will get their breakfast and they will go straight to class, or students will report straight to class get their breakfast um, later that morning and then report back to class and have breakfast in the classrooms. Students will eat lunch in a variety of ways, either socially distanced in the cafeteria, in their classrooms or, out, or outside. The principal of each school will make those um, determinations and they will communicate that to families. As we think about specials, which is for our elementary school groups and connections, those classes will be held each day. We have additional safety and mitigation efforts that we will put in place for chorus, band, and orchestra. I know there is a concern about band and instruments. We will, um, or we actually, we ordered um, what's called safety shields for the bells of the instruments. So each brass instrument will have a, a, a cover for it. And the school principal will be able to determine the student's special and connection schedule, and they will also communicate that to parents. Um, recess is very important, so we will participate in recess for our board policy. So again, students will wash their hands before and after recess. We will allow our students to play on the playground equipment, which includes our playscapes, as well as our swing sets. And our custodial staff will sanitize high traffic areas at the end of each day. An important note about transition, especially at middle school, is that our transitions will be staggered. So in middle school, um, in a normal environment, when students go to connections, usually the entire sixth grade, the entire seventh grade, the entire eighth grade will transition at the same time. Our middle school principals and leaders are making sure that those transitions are staggered to um, ensure that the minimal number of students are in the hall at one time. Student support is very important. We define student support as it relates to our special, edu special education students, which includes our K through 12 adaptive students. We also consider um, student support around the social emotional learning of all students, and then all, also our after school um, program, which is known as ASP. So as we think about our K-12 adaptive students, they will have the option for in-person or virtual instruction um, beginning on November 9th. We also know that it is important for those students that are choosing face-to-face -face instruction they may need a hybrid model before they phase in for a full five days. So our adaptive students will have the option to work with their IEP teams to have a transition plan that starts off two days per week 
and to those students feel comfortable and the IEP committee makes the decision that those students are ready for five days a week. So all of our um, parents and families that have students that are in our K-12 adaptive program, you can reach out to the case manager. The case manager will be actually reaching out to you very soon to help you make that decision around that in-person model. As we think about social emotional learning, we have had daily SEL lessons for our students in this virtual environment. We will continue those SEL lessons daily conducted by the classroom teacher. We will also have our school counselors provide classroom guidance and small group guidance to help students transition back to in-person instruction. And then lastly, as we think about student support, our after-school program. So we are planning for our after-school program to start either in late December or an early start date in January. So of course, we're going to monitor how this phase-in process goes. Um, we hope that it will be successful and we will learn um, additional things that we need to put in place to keep our students safe, and then we will make a decision around the after-school programming for our students. So at this time, I will turn it over to our Chief of Operations, um, Dexter Fisher. Good afternoon, I'm Dexter Fisher. I'm Chief of Operations for the Clark County School District. Before I get started, I would like to say that we have the necessary staffing, tools, and supplies to keep our schools clean. Early this summer, our custodial staff, our transportation staff, along with our nutrition staff, went through intense training to help get ready if and when we were going to open our schools. And we did bring in an outside vendor to help us with those training needs. School cleaning. Our school-based custodial team will operate in zones, provide regular ongoing cleaning throughout the day of all high-touch surfaces. High-touch surfaces will also be sanitized twice weekly using aesthetic um, spreaders. Signs posted to promote social distancing and minimize exposure. Hand sanitizing stations throughout all our schools. Water fountains will be turned on, turn off. Students may use bottle refill stations. I'm proud to announce that the Clark County School District have bought water bottles for all our students. Our building operations. School will be deep cleaned each weekend. Assign consistent seating each day to ensure that there are no shared seating in our classrooms. Limit use of shared classroom supplies, electronic devices, toys, books, games, learning aids. Our ventilation systems are updated and frequently monitored, and also we're changing filters um, on a consistent basis. The American Society of Heating and Refrigerating Air Conditioning Engineers and the EPA mandate that our building have fresh air mixed in our overflow systems. Transporting our students. Students are expected to um, practice social distancing at bus stops. Students are required to wear a mask on bus. All bus monitors, bus drivers will wear face masks and shields in our gloves. Hand sanitizers located on all buses. All buses are clean after each route. Students will sit two per seat, maximum 48 students per bus. Students will load the bus from the back and have assigned seats. When weather permits, one of them will be cracked along with the roof and emergency hatches. School buses will be deep cleaned each evening. Feeding of our students. When students return to school on November 9th, meals will be provided in two ways. In school students, breakfast, food carts will be placed in common areas so students can grab and go and eat in their classroom. For lunch, students will go through the cafeteria line social distance and eat in designated area based on schools. And like Mr. Gaskin mentioned earlier, we'll probably be eating some on the outside. For virtual students, students who are going to be learning virtual meals will be provided daily at curbside locations from 11 a.m. to noon at specific schools. However, we are looking to one that we can still deliver food to those students. At this time, I would like to step down from the podium 
and demonstrate some of the aids that we'll be using in our schools. Okay, we're going to improvise. <laughs> hey, can you still hear me? Thank you. So, one thing I want to show, one thing that we're going to do, we talk about the dividers. We had every student, of the student that we um, come in person, we have a divider. Now, each divider will have a clear side. Right now, this is just how the front clear, but we have a clear side on both sides for students to put on their desk in order to help them uh, prevent the uh, spread of the COVID-19 or cold or flu or whatever they may have. We'll be using directional signs uh, in the hallways where we stay six feet apart so students will see these signs in their buildings. Also, one of the things that we'll be doing once we have sanitized and disinfected classroom, this will be hung on each door of each classroom in the building. For a face mask, we have a clear face mask. We also have face masks for our um, pre-K and kindergarten teachers. And again, um, the Clark High School District will be providing those masks to all our students. One of the favorite toys that I like it's your electro static. We'll be using this to, um, to sanitize all our buildings, all our classroom, and all our spaces. So this will be part of our deep cleaning on the weekend. And when school is out in the afternoon, our staff will go by and use this equipment. I'm not going to pick this up. This is a folder. But we'll also be using it on our buses and also in our classroom. This was donated to us by Jima. They gave us four of these machines for every school in our district to equip to have these. From a clean standpoint, and what we're going to provide for all our teachers, these are uh, microfiber cleaning for each teacher for their classroom. So if the student is transitioning or they're eating a meal, they will take these, wipe with some spray here, spray on the desk. Wipe the desk off, discard it in a trash can. Our custodian staff will then come by and pick this up. All of the chemicals that we use are environmental friendly. As a matter of fact, they're more friendly than the wipes that we use. So everything that we're using in our buildings would be environmental friendly. So these are our toys and our things that we'll be using to keep our schools safe and keep our students, teachers, and staff safe. Thank you very much. So that concludes my presentation. I'll bring back Mr. Lawrence Harris. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. I'm looking forward to maybe being able to play with the electrostatic sprayer myself. Um, so that concludes our presentations for the evening. Uh, again, the information presented here tonight will be posted on our website. Uh, we are going to now enter the question and answer portion of our program. So the way the question of, uh, and answer portion will work, uh, in order to maximize the safety of those of you who are here tonight, we ask that you submit your questions online using our, uh, our tool here. So you can either take a picture of the barcode with your phone. You can also go to tejoin.com and you want to enter the nine-digit code 324-929-142. You do not have to create an account to submit a question. The way this will work is the questions will be received up here. And I'll ask the top questions that come in. For our viewers online, you also have the access to this code. You can also go to tejoin.com and enter that nine-digit code. As you submit your questions, I will read them out loud, and one of our expert panelists will uh, try and answer as many questions as we can. 
for those of you all that received a piece of paper as you walked in here tonight, if you do not want, you know, want to use technology or that's not that's not your jam, feel free to write uh, the question on the bottom of the piece of paper you receive. You can walk down with your mask on to the basket here at the front. Uh, I'll glove up and I will grab your questions and answer as many as we have here in person tonight as well. So without further ado, I will go ahead and ask our first question and one of our panelists will try to answer. So our first question from our thought exchange is, what are the metrics for having to go back online? Positivity rate backslash case count. And I will lean on one of my colleagues who may be able to come answer the question. Um, we are actually in consultation with our local health authorities right now, excuse me, about um, shifting from a reopening metric to a metric that encompasses guidelines for when we may shut schools. Um, that's not an easily identifiable number. There's nothing from public health that says this is the point at which schools should shut. It's more of a zoom out and look at the bigger picture surrounding the situation that is happening at a school that may lead to that discussion. So um, I would just say that it's underway, but really every individual situation that happens in our schools is gonna be evaluated by contact tracers and DPH, and we will follow whatever actions are recommended by public health. Thank you, Nurse Amy. Our next question that's coming through our thought exchange, what instruction is planned for students during 14 days quarantine due to COVID-19 exposure at school? Can you repeat the question then, 14 day yes. quarantine? All right, so we are committed to ensuring that there's not any um, disruption in students learning, especially when they are quarantining. So students will can um, continue in either synchronous or asynchronous learning. I think the bigger question is who is providing that synchronous and asynchronous learning. And of course, that is situational school by school. So um, in a perfect world, the student would be able to receive that synchronous instruction from their current teacher. Um, however, we would have to work with schools um, to make sure that that can happen. So what we will do is we will um, work with our principals around identifying that plan the same time that they communicate to parents that the student would need to quarantine for 14 days. We don't want students to go home and then wait for a follow-up phone call. We will try to work very rapidly to say, this is the amount of time that the student will be home, this is how they will receive their instruction, and this is the person that will provide that instruction for the student. Thank you, Mr. Gaskins. Uh, again, as a reminder to our guests in, in, in attendance here physically, use the star exchange, but again, you're here, so if you want to write your questions down and drop in the basket, feel free to do so, and I will be gathering questions from that basket as well. Um, I'm going to apologize to my colleagues. I think the next one may also be for him. Uh, if I chose in-person learning for my child, but COVID cases start rising, can I move my child back to virtual? Uh, So what we have um, decided as a district is that when an individual has selected a learning model, we ask for that um, those families to honor that learning model until the next semester, so until January 15th. Of course, we don't know what um, COVID is going to look like when we start school. So we are definitely open to having a conversation uh, with parents around um, their learning model, but for right now, we are very um, clear that if you register for the in-person instruction, that you will continue with in-person instruction until the end of the semester. If you register for virtual instruction, you will also continue that to the end of the semester. We have given some wiggle room around being able to change that model by Friday, which is our conference day. So if you have more questions, please email your principal. You can email us so we can give you some confidence around those mitigation efforts. But we would definitely need to revisit uh, the conversation around being able to change your model, especially if the COVID numbers go up or schools are having large outbreaks. All 
All right, our next question. Have schools been updated to an ME, oh, a MERV, MERV 13 filter? Our schools have not been updated to MERV 13. Right now we use MERV 8 um, in our systems. And the reason that we use uh, MERV 8 um, in our system is because the systems that we have in place that was installed in all our um, schools were based on using MERV 8. If we were to go up to a MERV 13, then that means our um, equipment would have to work a lot harder and it couldn't push fresh air through enough in order to do the job that our system was built to do. Um, as I stated earlier, um, we've updated um, from a filter standpoint, we have um, changed over a consistent basis. Um, we got fresh air consistently going through our, all our builders 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we feel like based on the science and the things that we have researched, talked to other school districts, that um, what we're doing in Clark County School District is the right thing to do, make sure that we got fresh air coming to our school buildings. You get a lot of questions coming in, so this is good. I'm trying to sort through them. Uh, this question is, is CCSD, what is CCSD's process for employees taking FMLA who will teach, vir who will teach vir virtually? Let me try that again, I'm sorry. What is CCSD's process for employees to take FMLA if they are teaching virtually? Good evening, I'm Lynn Duke, Chief of HR. If uh, teachers are teaching virtually, they will not take FMLA. They are actually working, and so they don't have to take leave for that. Is there a plan to use ionization to clean the air, and will air purifiers be provided to cla in two classrooms to ensure the most purified air? Good question. Uh, right now, we already have ion um, systems already in our um, HVAC system, so we've already had that going on within our systems. For the air purifiers, um, we've been debating that back and forth whether or not we should provide air purifiers for our um, schools. Our price um, went out, went our schools out today, and if we were to put a air purifier in this particular school, it would cost us seven thousand dollars. Keep that in mind, we've got 21 schools in the system. However, we will, I'm not saying that we won't do it, but we, we will investigate and take a look at it. But right now, the short answer is we will not provide the air purifiers um, in our school. But again, it will be a conversation that we will continue to have with our cabinet and with my um, plant services team. You're getting our steps in here tonight. Um, when the next semester begins in January 2021, I'm sorry. When the next semester begins in January 2021, will parents have the option to choose again, or is the choice is the is the cho or is the chosen option for the entire school year? I can answer that. You will be permitted to choose again. Questions. Uh, the, can we get clarity on the divider? The presentation stated that all K five will get the divider, but it was also stated that all students will get the divider. I believe we're going K five students will receive dividers and special education students as well. Yes. And the dividers are clear on both sides, so I just want to make sure our viewers heard that. I mean, three sides, thank you. It's a three-sided divider. Another example had uh, it was closed on the sides. Our dividers actually have a clear covering in the front, and there's a clear uh, side for both as well. Uh, are, will all employees be back to five days a week in person working in offices? Will we then be able to call? Yes, uh, all of our central office staff and teacher, uh, school staff will return to work in person in offices beginning November the 4th. 
Again, if you have any questions, please continue to submit them. Um, I'm watching the live chat now. I will give it 30 seconds. Lawrence, there's like a question from the back. Do you want to, oh, question in the back. Well, mm -hmm. I, I submitted them all to the same, and none of them ended up on yours. Okay, I, do you want to come, do you want to, you want to ask it out loud? Um, yeah, question. So my, my first one was the, um, the isolation period for those who were exposed. Um, is there going to be contact tracing that dates? 14 days back from the school district? Are they working in collaboration with Park County Health Department? How is the contract tracing going to happen to notify parents and students that they were exposed dating back 14 days? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, you're talking about the quarantine for 14 days when we have somebody who's identified as a positive case in our buildings? Yes. And your question is, how is the contact tracing going to work? Yeah. If you could just provide a little bit more clarity on, on what the process is and who is involved in that process. So <clears throat> every school in Clark County has a full-time school nurse. All of the school nurses are trained contact tracers right now. We've been doing it since students and uh, student athletes and staff returned midsummer. Um, we have regular meetings discussing different scenarios that pop up, but I can say with confidence that my 23 school nurses are all excellent contact tracers. Um, we also have the DPH that we can reach out to for any questions. So should somebody test positive in a school, the expectation is that the, the expectation is that the parent will notify, or the staff member will notify the school that there's been a positive case. And the contact tracing team at the school, the COVID response team, will figure out based on seating charts, bus routes, organizational structures throughout the day, who is identified as a close contact for that person who tested positive. And remember, a close contact is specifically identified as anybody who spent more than 15 minutes within six feet of that individual. Those folks who are identified as close contacts will be required to quarantine for 14 days. But because that incubation period is 14 days, are you going to date that exposure back by 14 days? That's the piece of the question that I'm, I think I'm not clear on. So is it going to be just at the onset of symptoms? Or is it going to be at the onset? For the individual who tested positive? For the So the contact tracing for the individual who tested positive is the contact tracing going to happen during the period that that individual was symptomatic, or is it going to happen for the entire period that that individual was in an incubation period? So is it going to happen for a 14 day dating back, or is it going to go back only while they were symptomatic? Well, the individual who tested positive, we would do contact tracing for two days prior to their positive test or onset of symptoms. So anybody that was in our school building and exposed to that individual for the 48 hours prior to them becoming sick or receiving a positive COVID test would be contact traced. The 14 days would be moving forward because remember the, the infectious period is, is 12 days for the person that's positive. The 14 days is for the individuals who have been exposed. And that starts on the first day of their exposure, which would be their last day around the individual who tested positive. Does that answer your question? No, I'm not, I'm not confident that works very well. But that's okay. Well, if, um, honestly, feel free to email me or call me and we can talk about that more in detail. We're following DPH guidelines for contact tracing um, and it's actually pretty objective. There's not a whole lot of subjectivity to it. So as long as we understand the dates and the requirements of quarantine and isolation, um, we can follow it pretty well, and we're planning to do so. I see you have another question. Yeah, I submitted like 17, and you haven't answered 
any of the ones that I've seen. Is it on the thought exchange or email? On thought exchange. Yeah, I was just, I'm just about to get to these other questions that are coming in now. I just want to check on that. So one of the questions that came in is, is CCSD providing, I'm going to ask, is CCSD providing options for students to eat outside regular, regularly? If not, why not? We are providing options for students to eat outside. Uh, second, another question that came in. Oh, I think we answered that one. Okay, so what's the plan for interim assessments, diagnostics uh, for students who will not be face to face? So we actually have all, sorry, we actually have already administered our diagnostic assessments. So those students were able to take those diagnostic assessments in a virtual environment. As far as our interim assessments, those students that are at home will take those interim assessments virtually with their teacher, monitoring through Zoom or whatever um, video conferencing application that they use. And our students, of course, that are in person will take those interim assessments as scheduled. Okay, I see some more coming in. I just do, do also want to again clarify the dividers are clear on all three sides. I see a couple of comments just now about that. Um, will the dividers be clean? Yes, we will clean the dividers and sanitize them to ensure that they are uh, in proper proper place when students come and learn. Man, do you just want to ask one of your questions? Uh, the, there's a question about communication when there's a closure. Uh, again, if, if the, there's exposure in the classroom and the student is sick, as Nurse Roar said, um, the school community will be notified. And if your, your student was identified during contact tracing, you as a family will also be notified so you get a second uh, notification. Can you expand on that for the community at large? Like, will the community have access to the numbers of cases in schools? Like, right now, you're listing it for the district. Um, as a positive cases and people in, in quarantine, is that going to be broken down on a school by school basis so that if I live in the neighborhood of the school, I will have access to that information even if I'm not a parent? The reason we're summing those numbers right now is because the numbers are so small. And so when the numbers, if hopefully they'll, hopefully will remain that small and we will never have to, but um, when we get to a certain threshold and I mean, I don't know, I can't remember. It's, it's both, so those numbers include our student athletes and also um, staff. So when we get to a threshold where the end size is large enough, we will start dividing it out by school. Uh, I see a couple of questions coming in about band, uh, but I just want to address that. I think Mr. Gaskins can answer the question that we will uh, be ensuring that band instruments are clean and not shared and the bells, and the bell covers have been ordered. Uh, when will parents know plans for new class assignments? So our goal is to um, inform all parents by conference day on Friday. Um, scheduling, and I see an assistant principal in the audience, is a very, very arduous task. We want to make sure that our student schedules are correct. We do not want to have to call parents more than once. It is a puzzle. It is very, very difficult. We spend um, the entire summer scheduling students, and our assistant principals and principals have been working around the clock to schedule students um, because we did not know how many students would elect for in-person instruction versus virtual instruction. Also, we wanted to um, accommodate those staff members that needed to um, have a virtual assignment. So our plan is to be able to um, inform all parents as well as students of the change um, during conference day. We also want to, um, next week after election day, have teachers make personal contact with those students if there is a change in schedule. So, hello, you know, you're new to my class. I know this is rough moving from another class. Welcome them with open arms, but we're trying to inform parents as soon as conference day, which is Friday. 
We have a couple questions coming in around transportation. Um, can we explain how buses will be loaded and unloaded? Can we discuss how buses will be sanitized and cleaned to maximize safety of students? And when bus, when bus times will be available for families? That's a lot. So when we, when our bus drivers and monitors get to their respective stops, we will load the bus from the back to the front. And granted, um, some of our bus come, we have pre-K uh, kindergarten kids, we will try to move them as close to the front as possible. So but we will load from the back to the front. And also, each student will have a assigned seat. So whatever seat they get on in the morning, be the same seat they'll get on in the afternoon. Now, because we're going to be making a number of routes um, in the district, after each route, our drivers will wipe down their buses. Then they're going to pick the students up, drop those students off, go back to the bus garage, wipe down their bus again, and when they get ready in the afternoon, go pick up kids, do the same thing. After we're finished with all our um, routes in the afternoon, and the drivers and the moms will then come back and sanitize that particular bus um, for the next day. Right now, we're still working on our routes. Um, Mr. Gaskin had already talked about the bail schedule, but we're still working on our routes. Um, Mr. Weaver and his staff are doing a really good job trying to tie that down, trying to make sure that all the students that's going to be coming back face to face um, will have a route. And we understand that because in some of our communities, there may be a large group of students, so we may have two or three buses in one community in order to transport those students to their respective schools. So again, uh, we'll be doing that and hopefully by the um, middle part of next week, once we got all our final numbers in, we're going to get those routes out to our families and to our communities. The good thing that we got going on this year though, that all our buses have a GPS tracking system. So as a parent, you can track and see when the bus is coming, when it's going to arrive, the same thing at our school. Our principals and assistant principals can monitor to the arrival of buses at their school. So that is a new device that we put on all our buses. I see we have. Go ahead. Um, my question is about contact tracing. Um, I, I know you said seating charge and six feet away. So does that mean if my student is in a classroom with a child that is, has a COVID positive test, but they're not sitting near each other in a seating chart that I won't be notified? That's a great question. You would definitely be notified um, that there was a positive case, but you would not receive the additional notification recommending quarantine unless your child was determined through contact tracing to be a close contact to that individual. So being in the same classroom with someone is not necessarily considered close contact. Not necessarily, but I guarantee you that we are going to err on the side of safety. So if we cannot determine exactly who was a close contact and who wasn't, we will err on the side of safety and quarantine a whole class. There's another question that came in that's getting, and I probably should explain the way the tool works. So if you, when you submit your questions on Thought Exchange, uh, the idea is that as others uh, have similar thoughts, they can like your thought, they can move it to the top of the queue. So that's kind of how the tool works. I don't want anybody to think I'm ignoring your questions. It's just the way the queue works is others in the community are reading your questions, they have similar questions, they can like it and star it, which brings it to the top. I do want to get this one because it has come in a couple of times. It looks like people are rewriting it in just different ways. If I'm just going to ask this one that's come in. If my child has a cold and a cough, but it's not necessarily COVID, Will they, uh, will they be sent home and be forced to quarantine for two weeks? Another great question, thank you. And the answer is no. We, as school nurses, have nursing judgment. We have um, nursing training and we are contact tracers. And we recognize that everybody who has a cough does not need to go home and quarantine for 14 days. There are significant symptoms of COVID. And if a student exhibits more than one, one or more significant symptoms of COVID, then we will call the family and recommend um, necessary courses of action. But 
we recognize that there are other <laughs> infectious diseases out there. Of course, if you have the flu, you also don't need to be in school. So our infectious disease policy remains the same. We ask that you not come to school if you're sick. We ask that you not come to school within 24 hours of having a fever, no matter what the cause of that fever is. But we also recognize that kids have runny noses and coughs because of allergies or because of asthma. And so um, we will really be watching out through our health screens for kids who are exhibiting significant symptoms of COVID. I see you have another question in the audience. Go for it. Um, so let's say there's a family that has a child in elementary school, a child in middle school, and the parent is a teacher. If the child in elementary school is in a 14-day quarantine because of a positive case in that classroom, are brothers and sisters and moms and dads in that child's household also considered close contacts for that case? And additionally, if the child uh, in elementary school has a positive case, then will the middle school classes of the sibling be notified of that close contact? Okay. So the answer to the second question is yes. If a child is uh, COVID positive, their siblings will be assumed to be close contacts and will be required to go home and quarantine. Okay. There are situations where siblings may not be close contacts within a household, but for the vast majority of cases, siblings are going to be in close contact with each other, and so that would be an automatic quarantine recommendation. Um, we do not quarantine contacts of contacts, which is your first question, essentially. Um, so if a student in an elementary school setting is quarantined because of another student in the class who tested positive, that student who's quarantined their family members would not be required to quarantine unless that student transitioned to a positive case, in which case the family members would then identify as close contacts because they live in the household, and so then they would be under, under quarantine. But per DPH recommendations, contacts of contacts are not required to quarantine. Can you speak on that in reference to um, like connections teachers that are teaching multiple grade levels, like a band teacher or a chorus teacher that? Um, needs to quarantine in a situation like that. How are those connections classes going to continue um, if the band teacher has to quarantine for two weeks? I'll turn that over to Mr. Gaskin. Thank you. So great question that we discussed at length um, yesterday with my team. So part of what we are trying to do with our connections teachers is that to, um, connection teachers are required to quarantine we will have a sub in those classrooms and we will try to have our band teacher or music teacher or whomever um, zoom into those classes while we have um, individuals, our substitute teachers or members of my team actually come into those classrooms and monitor those students while the teacher teaches from home. Uh, we have a question around uh, size caps size caps for classrooms. Will there be a cap on the number of students for, per classroom? That's the question. Class size. Will it be a cap on the number of students per classroom? So based on our square footage of our normal size classrooms, um, our recommended cap is 16. We do have um, buildings um, that are larger that can increase by one or two. Um, our largest, largest classrooms are our band classrooms, are our course classrooms. We had a conversation about this yesterday, especially with our middle school principals, that those classrooms can be much larger because of um, the space in those classrooms. But there are some key things to remember about those classrooms. So we are encouraging station teaching, which means that groups of students would work in groups and be separated from the other groups of students in the classrooms and they would rotate to the teacher so it will be a blend of synchronous instruction that the teacher is providing with that small group and then they would rotate the other recommendation that we receive from national organizations with band and orchestra is that they limit the playing time to increments of 30 minutes so students play for 30 minutes they stop playing there's some music theory instruction, and then they can point, um, continue playing for 30 minutes. But to answer the first question, our recommendation is 16, um, but we are working with schools one-on-one. -on -one. They feel that they need to go up because of that um, class space, and we receive that specific question. 
regarding our connection classes. I do want to address this question, and I do want to remind our viewers who are at home, because I see some comments coming in, and I just remind our folks here in person as well. We, of course, will not get to every question tonight, um, but our goal is to answer as many as possible within the time we've allotted, and then we will be going through the questions you're asking online and post responses uh, Friday morning. So we have we have a lot of time to do that as well. So I, I notice I see some comments asking what my question hasn't been asked. That's, that's possible, but you will receive a response on Friday. Uh, one of the questions that came up is, will our Board of Education begin meeting in person now that our students are going back to school in person? Dr. Ann, our Board President, has been reaching out to Board members to check the pulse on returning back to in-person meetings. Dr. Maddox, our Vice President of the Board, is here with us this evening and was with us yesterday. So they have been working on that and their goal, and actually it's saying exactly what some of the questions have said is that if we're asking students and staff to return then the board should also begin to return back to face-to-face -face meetings we do have some board members due to age or other health issues that may not be able to return so we're looking at ways to have them join us virtually but it is the plan to begin um, returning back to face-to-face -to -face board meetings in the near future I also do want to just ask for some of the folks here in person, if you do have questions, I'll actually jot it down, mainly so that we can answer it online, but also so that our online viewers can hear the question. And apparently there's some difficulty hearing the audience if you ask it out loud. So if you just jot it down, I'll read it out loud for you as well. Um, another question that came in was about polling places. We will be cleaning and sanitizing our buildings after the election. The question is that many schools are polling places and what measure will be taken after this happens on 11-3. Um, I can answer that and say that we will be cleaning and sanitizing our buildings after the election and we will ensure that all of our buildings are safe the day of and after for when students and staff return. Those polls, um, polling are limited to one area of each school, so those voters will not, voters will not have access to an entire school. So the schools that serve as polling locations, those polls take place in one specific location of the school and our custodial staff have been diligent um, just like they are with any other activities that have to take place in ensuring that the facilities are cleaned after voting. But um, constituents will not have access to the entire school during those activities on um, next Tuesday. And it does allow us almost an entire week before our students return. I'm going to use this opportunity since we're talking about November 3rd to quickly say that we are partnering with the Department of Public Health as well as the UGA Mobile Clinic and offering free back to school COVID testing for all of our students, our staff, and their families. And we encourage everybody that's a part of the Clark County School District community to come out and get tested on November 3rd here in the Clark Central parking lot. Um, the test will be free. It'll be a drive through line. Um, it'll be safe and we really encourage folks to get tested so that we can um, make as safe as possible return to school. A question that's come in is how will we will address parents and students that are with that withhold positive case results. We can address that. <laughs> I think this is what, what I'm talking about when I say this is a community effort. We have to do the right thing. We have to act in the interest of public health. And if we don't all do that, then we're not helping each other out as we try to return to school. So I would just Encourage, encourage everybody to do what's right, get tested if you're sick. If you receive a positive case, report it to your school. Um, that's the only way that this is gonna work. And I'll add to that, there's been a lot of concern about staff that may have to quarantine repeatedly. Um, if you're familiar with the Federal Leave Act, it allowed for 80 hours of COVID leave that doesn't count against sick time. Um, and we have decided as a district that we will extend that to our staff for as many hours as they need in order to encourage staff to um, take care of our community, just like Amy said. We don't want people making the decision of, am I going to get paid or do I report that I was exposed to COVID? So we extended that leave and we hope, like she said, that our families will um, do the same thing. 
Mr. Harris is going to get these questions from Dr. Maddox, and after we take these questions, and I think the gentleman standing might have, you have a question too, sir? Yeah, sorry, I came in late. I was no, it's fine. After we take your question and the questions that are being written, we will end the question and answer component, but we will continue, as Mr. Harris said, to answer questions. They will be posted on Friday on the website. We've dedicated time as a team to go through the questions that we've received tonight, last night, and over the last couple of weeks, trying to make sure that we are grouping questions that are very similar in content um, so that we can get responses to individuals. I do ask for understanding when you email us with questions. I said to someone yesterday, I'm trying really hard to be responsive, but surprisingly, my only work is not answering questions. And that's the same thing for all of our staff. We have critical work that we need to do to ensure that we're instructionally and operationally ready for students to come back. So if we're not able to respond to you within an hour or two hours, it is not that we are um, ignoring you, but we have critical work to do that is about our students. So I know for me, a lot of times, my email responses may not come back until 1130 at night. And that's when I'm able to sit down and finally have time to check email. So just know that if you're not getting an immediate response, unfortunately, we're not a call center. We are a school system and we are working diligently to do what we need to do for our kids. And then we will get back to people on emails as efficiently as we can, but we will continue to prioritize service to students in our work. Thank you. We are going to address the questions that are written. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. And I saw you there too. My apologies. So anyway, I was, um, my will come back, and there'll be some students in person, some students still doing virtual, obviously. And that teachers will be teaching both, possibly simultaneously. And so I guess my question is, how will we be doing that? And I, I know different models. I'm just curious which one the district is looking at. So we've offered four um, different models to schools. So I can go back this very quickly. Sorry, I came in. No, you're fine. You're fine. Um, so the separated model where they're not teaching at the same time, there's a group of teachers teaching virtual students, a group of teachers teaching in-person students, the segmented model where a teacher may teach a group of students in person, and then another part of the day teach students virtually. The simultaneous model, that is the model that you are um, speaking to. So we've worked with schools around that model. In some cases, teachers have preferred that model because they've bonded with their students um, and they don't want to have their students be taught by other teachers. So the principal is making those decisions. So the principal will inform their um, parents of the model that their student will be participating in. And it it's not going to be uncommon that a school may adopt three or more models. It just depends on how many students are virtual, how many students are in person, and then also the expertise of that teacher. Um, in some cases, there is an advanced math teacher at middle school, and there's only one advanced math teacher or two advanced math teachers that can teach those students. Uh, we have two uh, questions in writing. Uh, when there is a class or school closure due to a staffing issue, for example, teacher develops symptoms and needs to leave immediately, and cases where teachers call and sit, what is the, mo the mode of communication? Phone call? The mode of communication to the parent? Yes. Okay. Um, it is our plan <laughs> to um, try not to close a classroom or a school day of, right? After the kids are there, it's very problematic to try to get kids back home when parents have gone to work. So we hope that we have enough layers built in that we can cover that classroom. We will never double up. That's not safe, so we won't do that. Um, but we also realize that we've had challenges with substitutes um, having enough for the past few years, right? So. We're just gonna have to play it by ear and see what happens. It is, you know, like I said, if we get to that point where it's a real emergency, we don't have district staff that can go cover because we're already covering. I said last night, I don't know if anybody could hear me, but we would 
then start to look at, do we need to close down the grade level at that school? Do we need to close down the school? Um, because we can't sustain our district office staff spread out everywhere. There just won't be enough of them. But we have subs that are assigned buildings. Um, we have lists of staff um, in the building that can help cover in an emergency. So that, that's the plan. Do staff have the option to teach from home or do virtual teachers have to come into the building? Um, our uh, staff that is assigned virtual teaching options right now are assigned because there is a medical reason for them to have it, so they will not be in the building. Uh, so we are uh, our communications managers writing down some of the questions that are coming in online as well as on our YouTube page. I appreciate the folks who are posting on the YouTube page, but definitely encourage you to use the thought exchange because that allows us to see which questions they're not capturing. Um, one of the questions that came in via the YouTube channel is feeding high school students while virtual. Um, and that is the question. Based on the numbers that we had when we were all virtual, we had about 325 um, high school students that needed meals. So I uh, got to talk with Ms. Farmer and Mr. Weaver on uh, transportation. We're going to take a look and see what we can do to get those meals delivered to those students. One thing uh, we want the community to know, though, that we have 15 schools um, that will be available for the drive through So hopefully, some of those students will be close enough on um, that be a community school can walk to, to get their meals. However, if that's not the case, then we're going to try to come up with a plan where we can deliver those meals to those students. Okay, so just a couple of um, additional wrap ups. As Mr. Fisher said, so less than 400 students out of almost 4,000 students. So we do believe that we will be able to support those students with their nutrition needs. And then again, if you pull out those who are not within close proximity of their schools or do not have other ways to access the meal. So that's the information we're now working to gather. There was a question regarding hiring additional custodial staff. And as we said in the very beginning, um, when we started this conversation, our board has been more than supportive in terms of telling us to do what we need to do to ensure that we have safe operations for our students. And I know there have been some comments about the air purifiers and costs. We will not make a decision about something that we need for safety because of cost. What we will do is make a decision regarding if a safety mechanism is needed based on professional and expert opinions. So we have Mr. Bailey here. He is um, our operations director. He does an amazing job with plant services. He's experienced in the area of HVAC. He has been working. He's done air quality tests in all of our schools and will continue to do that. That is a priority for us is our student safety. If we come into a situation at any point and we realize that the air quality in a particular classroom, a particular school, is um, one that is subpar for what we need to ensure optimal student and staff health, health, we will do what we need to do to purchase what is needed for those classrooms. So some things are not needed on a blanket basis and just by virtue of how class schools are um, set up, what type of systems we have in those schools for HVAC and other things that we have to take into account. So, you know, some people assume that our older schools actually have worse air quality, and I think Mr. Bailey has found that's not necessarily the case. So he is utilizing appropriate um, resources and equipment to go in almost daily to check the air quality of our buildings and will continue to do so. And if at any point we need to make a purchase to support students, we will do that. And the board has been gracious. We're doing some emergency purchasing um, now. Mr. Harris and his team have worked and gotten dishwasher safe water bottles for students. We're getting those purchases in. The dividers have been purchased. We've had to shift some funds. 
I've been emailing the board. Um, that happens sometimes at 1130 at night as well to say this is what we need for our students. So we will continue to do that. We will continue to monitor what is needed. We will continue to monitor research, best practices, guidance from DPH, guidance from CDC to ensure that we're taking actions that are in the best interest of all of our students and families. So please rest assured that safety is a priority for us, for our students and for our staff. And we will not compromise um, anyone's safety for cost. And if we get to a point where there is something that is entirely too costly for us to be able to do, then that's when we have to make a decision that we can't have our students in school. So we will never sacrifice um, safety of anyone due to cost. I think I have answered most of the questions that we had at the top. There are many other questions and we get that, we appreciate that. We also want to be respectful. We have um, a storm coming if you all haven't recognize that we've been getting a lot of emails from Gina today and um, I want our staff to be able to get home, take care of their families, do what they need to do so that they are able to stay safe so we can keep your children safe and our staff safe. So we thank you for coming out. We thank you for tuning in virtually. We thank you to those who are here face to face. Again, we thank you um, for questions. That's how we get better. There's things we, we don't think about everything. So we appreciate questions to help us improve. And I think that's the key, to help us improve. We want questions that are aimed at helping us to do better for our students. We have to be honest, we're not perfect. Publix isn't perfect. Piedmont Athens Regional isn't perfect. The University of Georgia isn't perfect. We're all doing the very best that we can to ensure safety. We are committed to that. And I hope in my opening remarks, you have heard that us delaying opening in Clark County Schools um, in the midst of what everyone around us has done shows that we don't look at a blanket approach to doing what needs to be done for our students. We don't say that this is a homogenous group and everyone else is going back. We took some heat and I'm prepared to continue to do that because we stayed out. And that wasn't necessarily best for every family, and every student, but we felt like in light of the cases and where we were as a community, it was the best thing for us as a whole at that time. But now at this time, we feel that the best thing to do is to start to move forward in a cautious manner, utilizing the most appropriate mitigation strategies that we can. We don't take that lightly. We do not take the life of your child lightly. I have a child in the system. I have a spouse in the system. I'm in the system. If that happens, and I take it lightly, three of the four of my immediate household are gone. So this is real to me as well. And these children's lives are real to me, but also their opportunities past this are real. These children have to live, these children have to read, they have to write post-COVID. And we cannot continue to sacrifice what we know they need to have opportunities. There's an opportunity gap there. And we're going to do everything we can to close that gap. And we're going to take every measure, make every purchase that we have to make to ensure that every child, and that's every child in Clark County School District has the opportunity to have opportunities. And that's my commitment as an interim superintendent. I want every child to have an opportunity to have opportunities. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support of Clark County Schools. Thank you to our team for making this happen tonight. Thank you to our custodial staff, our nursing staff, our instructional services staff, all of you who are here. Uh, my principal, thank you for opening up your home to us. Mr. Thomas, thank you for the last minute of making this happen with Ms. Anderson. We thank you for your flexibility. And we appreciate everyone's commitment to Clark County School District. We are truly going to continue to be better together. Have a great evening.